live. Hello, everyone. Can you hear us out there? Let us know in the chat if you can. I'm going to Hello. assume. <laughs> I'm going to assume that we can. Um, this is the RPG pundit, final boss at Internet Shitlords, and I am joined today, as usual, by Venture Satanis and Florida Man RPG, aka Joe Bittman. And tonight we have a returning guest star, uh, Griffith Morgan from uh, Secrets of Blackmoor and the Lost Dungeons of Tonisborg. So we're very happy to see you here again, Griffith. Yeah, thanks for having me on. This is great. I'm excited Actually. to be here. And Venger just left. Venger. Oh, there we go. Product hey, pitch. Hey, look what I got. It's so nice. nice one. There. Yeah, it's a purple one. He'll be eBaying that tomorrow. So I've been the the urge for about four to six months. So, you know, I'll probably keep it. I'll, yeah. I mean, I'll definitely keep it. I'm joking. I, okay. I wouldn't I wouldn't eBay that. Even if I had, like, absolutely no use for it, I still wouldn't eBay it because... It's gamer stuff. Uh, it was a very generous gift. And I, I very much appreciate it. But um, it's also awesome. So yeah, thanks. So I wouldn't... Um, just for that reason, I wouldn't get rid of it because a lot of useful it's, old it's school bleeding. lore. So in between the last time that you were here, Griffith, and and mm -hmm. now, um, you had I had done a review of Lost Dungeons of Tonisborg. It was uh, uh, yeah, it was amazing because we were we were ramping up to do. We just finished the the Kickstarter for the North Cape. Uh, Maple War game, which did pretty good, but not as well as we had expected. Um, I didn't really know how to reach out to that the war game community, and it's it's kind of fractured all over the place because they're like, I only do ancients or I only do modern. But then you, we were ramping up to do this new Kickstarter for these books, and I was looking at at uh, YouTube, and there was your review of it, and uh, and actually like i looked at them like the view count is ridiculous on it it's just like people are watching that review and they're like you know going it's just that review in in the in their like stack of, of videos it's just it just keeps climbing and climbing because people want to know what it is and yeah. uh it's like the it's like the bizarro world of chult sales yeah where chult sales like go up ever so gradually and then sometimes go down even uh, oh, chult and, sales. Like, people See, give me back books I thought you were talking uh, so about it's like snails. the opposite of that. Okay. Like the Superman went to like. Well, you did a nice review. The Red Sun. <laughs> and Avengers is doing the opposite of that. But no, what I would like to say is that, you know, uh, there there are certain people out there that do not like certain people for no good reason. And and they've never really done anything to support us. And then we've got, like, you guys have always been really supportive, which is why I sent each of you a book. Chris and I agreed, like, yeah, let's just send him a book, you know. Mm -hmm. And um, and uh, the you know the the pundit effect took over, and the sales on the Kickstarter were phenomenal for for us. It was the, I think it was the biggest biggest uh, Kickstarter we've had yet. And um, so yeah, I don't know. Thanks for thanks for pitching it. You know, for the fact that now the book is available again. Of course, when I came out with the video at that time, the, I know it was the, hilarious. The surprise twist at the end of the video for my viewers. I review this awesome book, and then I say, "Well, you can't really get it anymore." <laughs> right. So I, that was, then we that all was these just... people saying, "Well, we we you have to get him to do another printing," and and so uh, yeah, we launched like two weeks later or three weeks later. We were already in the process of doing it, but it was like, "Wow, yeah, I didn't know you were like thanks to me." So I I love that. <laughs> no, but I just appreciate you doing that. Um, I don't know. I saw your show on. Uh, um, you were talking about a lot of the stuff having to do with WotC, and I left you a message, and I was like, "We should, we should talk about that." And you said, "Yes, be on the next show." Mm -hmm. So I really want to get talking about WotC stuff because I think that that's uh, really interesting, actually. All right, that that makes sense because later on in the show, at a certain point when we all chill our stuff, you'll have an opportunity to promote your current projects and whatnot. So. Yeah, so, and you can so, still get it. You know, we got we got the Kickstarter. We, we decided to leave it open till Christmas for people who want to order a copy. They're not going to get delivery on them because we can't manufacture them like that. They're handmade. But if you want, you know, if somebody wants to buy it for themselves for Christmas or their spouse wants to get their husband something or like something, so whatever. There, there you go, guys. Um, you can still order it right now. Yeah, so you can like, I don't know, you could print out the 
the order form and be like, this is what you're going to get, you know. Um, but yeah, go on. I'm interrupting you. Sorry. So if I remember correctly, the the video that you're you're talking about was my my most recent one, which was called "Game Designers Don't Control D and D Anymore," where I was yeah. pointing out the fact that it's for the first time since Lorraine Williams that the people in charge, the CEO of Wizards, and of course the CEO of Hasbro, which was the former CEO of Wizards, neither of them are gamers or game designers. They're corporate suits, right? And, and they're yeah. both specialists in online gaming and microtransactions. And they have a plan that they've basically mm -hmm. laid out that they want to reinvent d and in, in a way that is more easily monetized where they have four different points of emphasis. One is the virtual tabletop. Second is movies. The third is um, video games, apart from the virtual tabletop. And the fourth is basically lifestyle brand stuff, toys and collectibles and, and you know, stuff yeah. that isn't actually gaming, but that just has the D&D logo on it. I'm really so looking I'm forward to the, the nose trimmer. The, yeah. the D and D nose trimmer. I'm gonna be really proud using that. Yeah, um, go on anyway. Um, I mean that. Yeah, that's the sort of stuff. When I first saw that, I was just like, "Oh goody, you're gonna leave the, the tabletop realm, and now gamers that like to play face to face, whether it's on Zoom or wherever, you know, I play on Zoom with people that I can't be near, um, can play and buy games by people like me and you, and we don't have to deal with this big corporation that's been putting out." basically garbage for for several years um, um and my you know that's my take from being i'm an old dnd player I, I mean i think that you that's kind of a, a harsh comment i know and a lot of people are like oh but this is my precious thing and it's like yeah but you don't know the history of where, where this is coming from and so you don't have like uh you didn't buy one of these babe maybe in 1977 okay and um okay. when they came out with when I first started taking notice of of uh, 5e, I I went I was in a bookstore and I just bought a set, a Stark set, right? And I brought it home and I read the thing cover to cover, and I was like, well, this is kind of interesting, but I don't know. And there was something I didn't understand, and I wanted clarity. So I thought, okay, I got to find a definition for this one thing in this book. And there was it wasn't in the index, it wasn't in the book. It's the most like the starter set is the most shoddily set garbage set of rules like these are people that are professionals these are not you know amateurs doing this um and they're producing this thing that's that's barely comprehensible like if i if i looked at that starter set i probably wouldn't understand how to play a game at all and and so i thought you know i, I like to compare it to that basic set like the basic set this basic set is a very understandable volume it has examples it has a pullout sheet that has all your charts right here, but it's the most it's the most simple thing that costs like ten bucks in in uh, nineteen seventy seven, and so it seems like they purchased this you know they have they have this really nice commodity that's really valuable, but even from the beginning they haven't really known what to do to make it really good, and um, that's my rant about the start yeah. set, um, but wow. you know like people complain about the original. The original designers of DD, these guys weren't professionals. They were basically Gary was working out of his basement, so was Arneson. Don Kay was storing the boxes in his garage. Um, and and these not professionals maybe produced something that was a little bit difficult to decipher, but there had never been anything on the planet like this when these appeared. And so you would think that after nearly 50 years that these people with this big company making the big bucks, I assume they're making good cash writing the games, right? Um, they could produce something that people could actually understand when they purchase it. Um, I didn't, I looked at it and I was just like, wow, this is a mystery. I'm a war gamer and this doesn't make sense to me really. I just want to find a definition and it's not in the index, but that's let me, let me, one let me of my rants. Grip it, but um, at the time that fifth edition was created, the guy in charge was a real gamer and a real game designer, Mike Merle. Yeah, right? yeah, he was. Right? He was he typing out the rules, right? The people typing out the rules. But did he write the yeah. starter set? Well, he didn't really. No, I mean, he, yeah, he was he, he was the he was the overall visionary of the you know of what the, the system was going to be like. But it wasn't the guy who was typing out the material that was going to end up in the books, right? And right, those right. People, 
even at that point, I mean, they were professionals in a sense, uh, but most of them were actually taken from the much larger division in Wizards that makes Magic the Gathering. <laughs> and right, they, were, they were experienced. To write stuff for, for the D&D books. Um, so they they weren't necessarily the big difference. I mean, because you're right, Gygax and Artisan, I mean, they weren't professionals either, but they were actual gamers that were very familiar with how the game works and how gamers read books and all of that sort of thing. And some of the stuff, some of the the way that the sentence structure is set up or that the organization of the books of 5e are set up, you can kind of tell that the people that wrote it are people that were um, mostly trained in designing these rules for collectible card games, right? Because they're, they're very focused uh -huh, on uh -huh. conditions and, and specific terminology for specific situations and stuff like that. But they're not particularly good at ordering it in the way that a gamer that a D and D gamer reads it, you know, they they're reading they right. wrote it like a rule manual for a card game. You know? Yeah, I mean that's you know I mean I'm an amateur, right? I got this book here I made, right? Here's the black cover, um, and we went through everything in this to make it, you know, to try to make it as understandable as possible. We were rearranging sections so that it was like, well, you know, this section needs to go before this because it seems more logical that way. And um, I mean, we put our, you know, we put blood into this thing and um yeah. and so that's kind of the problem when you have a big corporation doing something and, and i'm not yeah. you know that's just what happens because you've got like all these people in different areas doing different things it's sort of like when programmers you know when they write a program and it's really huge you've got all these pieces and then the integration stage happens and you have to integrate it and everybody's like oh i hope it actually still works when we go to integration because that could be a whole other problem and um so yeah, I mean, when I'm griping about the star set, I'm not even complaining about the game system itself because there are certain ele elegant things in that. But um, I just was, in, you know, it was fascinating to me to see like it's been almost 50 years and nobody can write a decent set of rules, you know. Well, and, but, and it's um, only new things then, right? Because now the the guys that actually had some understanding of game design, like Mike Merles, they're gone, right? Some of yeah. these type of monkeys that were there just writing the text in fifth edition, like like Jeremy Crawford, are now in more senior positions. So they're basically mediocre people that have been moved up by seniority. And oh. most of the rest of those guys, <clears throat> the, the Magic the Gathering people, are gone also. And what you have instead there are people who are rank amateurs that were hired for a combination of diversity purposes and out of nepotism for who they know, right? So you've got a bunch right. of people, lots of books are filled with people doing parts of these books who have zero experience in writing or designing games and may not even have actually played D&D. Some of them are like vegan cookbook designers that happen to know the lead guy in the book project, you know, and they put that, they give that yeah. person a job, right? Like they have no, no skill whatsoever, no training whatsoever in designing games or in, or, or, and may not have played D and D for all we know. Yeah. Right. Right. Well, yeah, that's what I see a lot too, is uh, you look at the list of designers and you'll see people that maybe are experienced at designing other kinds of games. They might be like computer programmers or I don't know, they just like a website designer. And it's like, they're a really good website designer. They, they should probably be a great game designer too. Right. And, uh -huh. and who knows if they, like you said, if, whether they play a game or not, but their vegan vegan cooking skills are probably really, really up there. So, Perfect. let me interject right here. Uh, we have a new subscriber. We always call him out. So, Bill Billis, uh -huh. right? Thanks. And then I also noticed he just something in the chat too. Oh, sure. He's getting a free super chat here. He said, "Greetings from Greece. I was glad to see in on the one D and D trailer YouTube comment section that many people reported to the didn't follow Watsy like she." <laughs> Bill, thanks for subscribing. But uh, I mean, that was that was the thing about what I wanted to talk about is just kind of like you know they they think that they can take this hobby that I mean that's kind of that's the that's the real thing is you've got these these CEOs that aren't gamers and they think that they're going to take they're going to convince gamers to want to do this social game that you do together with your friends and that you're going to leave the table and you're going to go home and you're going to get on your computer for even more hours per day. <clears throat> and uh, and start playing D and D online with their service and paying to use their service. That's a that seems absurd to me. Like 
uh, it's sort of like you're just trying to change everything about it's not i mean as bad as i considered 5e to me being an, an, an old gamer i see 5e and what they've done with 5e and what what the game modules are like and i'm like this isn't even dnd anymore it just has the brand name on it you know and so when you go that much farther the 5e players are now part of the osr in, in essence because they're still tabletop gamers but what are we gonna you know, I, I actually wanted to be with you because I wanted to know what you guys thought too. It's not like well, I'm here to, you know, I, I think my the, piece. the more that Watsi or just any any of these companies try to move towards microtransactions and like you know, putting the game to be played online, the more they're putting themselves into direct, direct competition with video games. And right. if you're already getting on the computer, you know, at that point, I, yeah. I think that video games are going to win out, you know? I mean, I think they've got the experience playing at a table with real people is like the real big draw of the game, you know, and it, it diminished when you play online. Yeah. Well, that's, but that I, was the thing I noticed too. Go ahead. I'm I think that, the host that, that uh, some of the people here have, um, have made that shift. I think that, that wizards is taking advantage of the phenomenon that happened during, during COVID where uh, a bunch of people who couldn't meet up in person started playing virtually. Right. And so right. They, they've seen this and they want to turn it into a more permanent thing, because, of course, there are some people that did that. And, and maybe because, you know, it's harder to get a group of human beings together in the same room. They kept doing it. And and we know, you know, like we know that D&D Beyond and, and, and a lot of other virtual tabletops increased their numbers during the pandemic years. And they're betting that they can get those people to stay there by creating this like super you know like i don't know if you've seen the promotional video for one D, &D but they're they're showing what what is supposed to be their new virtual tabletop that's going to look really awesome and of course you know they're that that's where they're going to put in the microtransactions and and they're making that bet and i don't know if they're if that bet's gonna pan out for them or not i think that that um joe they're gonna very split the market work. is what they're gonna do yeah, and then they're gonna hope that they can grab another mark, another piece somewhere else, and like oh, like was it Joe that said that. you're going head to head with these people that have game companies that have been doing online gaming forever and know how to do that, and you're gonna have to hire people away from those companies, or I mean it's gonna cost a lot of money to do that. Um, <clears throat> um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I think one of the things I saw online was people when people like me were saying, "Well, this is stupid." And they were saying like, well, you just don't want people to make money. And it's like, well, wait a minute, you know, this is my book. I'm selling it for a lot of money. I'm not against people money making money, but I am against, you know, where's the value? Where's the value in this thing? And that was one of the things that I, I, I'm really curious about. Um, you know, where do you think the value is going to come out of this for people that are tabletop gamers? Do we do we need do we need uh, Watsi anymore? I know I haven't, you know, I've got my old books. I would say that it's the difference between creating worlds freely and then creating worlds under the heel of this monolithic dystopian corporate hive mind that's just like stomping its boots on your imagination yeah over and over again uh and under those conditions you create worlds yeah so those yeah. are the two distinctions uh maybe not the first year or two because they're trying to ease people in and maybe they'll be as generous as possible but you know the end result the slippery slope is going to lead right to like you can't create that kind of world because blah 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 and xyz and woke reason number 17 and then you're like, yes, master, okay, master, only the smallest of worlds, only the right. dumbest of ideas. Well, that's going to be the question, right? Is like, are you going to, you know, if it's programmed into a computer system, despite people thinking that you can do anything with a computer, if it's not programmed into it, then it can't do the thing that you want to do. So the question is, is are you even going to have the space to build a world with this new system that they're doing online? If you were to go online, are you are you just there for a turnkey experience like any other video game that you buy where you know the maps are going to be what they give you the story is going to be what they give you and and you don't have any input whatsoever you just go through and you're just there for the ride right well no um, no it's going to be more insidious than that because they're 
what they're doing is they're going to allow a whole bunch of tools where where DMs can make their own dungeons, make their own campaigns, okay. and all this sort of thing. But that the, they also are they're going to ha- they're going to have the right to share the stuff that you make, and this is part of the reason why they so they'll they have ownership of what you yeah, make on they, their they, system. Yeah, you won't own it. Wizards will, right? And and they this is part of why they've said that they're not going to have an OGL for one D and D, right? So one D and D is not going to be open source. Which means that other virtual tabletops that aren't owned by wizards won't be able to use this stuff. Which means that other people won't be able to to take this stuff out and p- publish them for themselves, right? And 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 all of that. So um, their idea is basically to to capture. And I mean, they may figure out some way to monetize it for certain people or whatever. But 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 they want to capture the control over the creativity of all these gamers that are going to be on the virtual tabletop um as as the new market for how they're going to to produce you know new material new adventures right. and new campaigns and all of that um the only good side of that is that it it might mean that a whole bunch of the the woke people that are in charge of the writing of, of D books right now are suddenly going to be out of out of work you know because i don't right. we don't know how how much actual dead tree books are going to be published anymore certainly the the probably the three main books will be but uh, uh i don't know if they're going to like even keep caring to enough to to make other books that are not focused on the virtual tabletop experience you know yeah that's kind of limiting i mean i mean we're unpacking a lot of stuff i mean the one of the things i you know um well, I mean, have you guys played any of the modules they did for 5e? I don't, I haven't played any 5e. I just, I have zero interest. The closest I got was a friend of mine used the system to do a, a sailing game. And, um, I, and I like the mechanics. I've read it. a lot of them, but I haven't played them. Okay. Read them, do you, I, them. I mean, how good are the, the modules that they produced? They're crappy, like always. Like. I mean, have they all been, in your mind, well, at least the ones that I've read, it seemed pretty good. Or have they been bad. sloping they're down too, or, you know. They're all quite bad. You know, and, and the really? newer ones are, are vastly worse than the older ones. Yeah. I mean, I saw the whole thing for Strixhaven and, and, uh, and you know, I don't care if there's a, uh, what could possibly be two men dancing together because, you know, I go to the gay bar to go dancing too. So that's not a big deal to me, but, um, um. I just thought it, it looked like a really horrible concept. Like the, I guess the, the big difference, it's been a, it's been a cascade every time D and D is owned by a more corporatized organization, the cascade toward wanting to create a turnkey product that anybody can open and use where, where the, the dungeon master be, has become secondary in a way the dungeon master is really just there to read the stuff out of the book to you and roll dice for you. And they're not, they don't like the, the. This is the most important player at the table is the dungeon master. I mean, if you don't have the the dungeon master playing there, you don't have a game. And and what they've wanted to do to make their product easier to comprehend by a greater number of people is they've they've wanted a much more turnkey product. Um, they've taken away decisions for the dun, dungeon master because instead of I always use the example of like if you taste the caviar, the Kieran Abakay's uh, can. It, Kieran I recalls the example of, uh, you know, if I taste the caviar, I don't get to decide my character likes caviar. I have to roll on the ca- caviar tasting chart to determine if my character likes the caviar or not, you know. And and so um, the dungeon master has all this freedom in, in the in the more classical form for playing role playing games, but in the corporatized version, you you want to make sure that the, all the players are having a good time, and you don't want anybody to die, so you make it harder to die. You nerf the game. So everybody's buffed and nerfed, um, and I'm going somewhere with this. But and and it's consequently, you're creating adventures that maybe aren't. I don't know. It's strange because people keep saying that these things are what they want, but from what I'm hearing, sales on products that are that are their pre-produced products like Strixhaven, kind of bombed. And I think it started. Did it start with uh, Tasha's Cauldron thing, thingy? Um, yeah, I mean, but I don't I, follow it too closely, but because these more recent adventures and campaign books that they've written have moved away because like the earlier ones where you're going like, you know, into the underdark and even the, the one with the, 
uh, that remade Waterdeep to look much more like modern day Seattle or what have you, they still had a classic sort of adventure model to them, right? But but, but these You're newer still ones were like actively engaging in deconstruction of adventure. You know, like in, in Strixhaven, you don't go out and have adventures or go to dungeons or fight some some great evil you you're it's about your life as a, a person in college and going to the prom and running a coffee shop and how your life is a hot mess right which right. is something that maybe a kind of 30 boring. Year old, uh unmarried feminist person with an lgbt flag in her in her living room uh is gonna find interesting you know who writes vegan cookbooks but it's not right. something a typical gamer is gonna find interesting in playing right uh, right, and they've right. been like, into the witch light. Uh, that that the adventure with the carnival is a whole adventure that's set up to punish you if your characters engage in combat and to reward you if you just go and experience the twee wonder of the of the carnival and find nonviolent resolutions to to confrontations. You know, um, right. so they're preaching at you and they're writing crap. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, it's interesting because you know the big thing was that the they had that big proclamation where they said like, we have not monetized Dungeons and Dragons enough. Um, and, and the verbiage was a little wrong. You know, like if I was doing that speech, I would have been like, we've been very successful and we see these other areas we can expand to and we will increase income for the company and for you stockholders. That's a little bit more positive. That's maybe how I would have stated it instead of like those goddamn D and D players aren't buying enough of our crap and we're not making enough money. And, we're gonna have to do something, so we're gonna do this thing because the D and D players suck, and we need, you know, we yeah. and we need to figure out a way to like stick a big needle in them and suck as much more blood as we can out of them. Um, I mean, that's the way it kind of feels, right? I, I don't know. That's what I thought when I saw it. And, and yeah, it seems yeah, like the same thing. Their version of D and D is like, well, this is only going to be D and D for us if we get enough money. Like that's their whole reason for hanging on and doing what they do uh our reason for dnd is to make dnd awesome and to right. use dnd awesomely and they're on the other end and by now in up the corporate ladder of of dnd how long it's been since its inception um you know uh, the people that want to monetize dnd have to be over here and the People that first and foremost, because you know we all monetize it to some degree because we love it. Right. But first and foremost, you just love role playing games, and you know you're very passionate about fantasy role playing. And uh, those two, you know, unless something massive changes, they're never going to get back together. It's always going to yeah. be, and it's going to divide people. And it, there's like one half. Of, the, of what a wizard's audience is going to go with them. And I figure about 50% of the audience that wants to just love and use D&D and fantasy role-playing games in general will go the other way. Well, that's the, that's the big thing is that the people that... So they're basically going to divide their market in half, okay? And then now we got half, and there's this big market of gamers that do things online, right? And we're going to try to peel away this much so that we can get back or bigger. But we're not just fine. There's not like this pool of gamers out there that are playing online and, and they're ready to like, like all gamers like their game, you know, and if you're playing, I don't really do computer games that much anymore. But, you know, when I played certain games, I played my specific online games because well, I really like Twitch games. I want a, tw a first person shooter. That's the most twitchy thing you can find. And, and deadly as hell. And, uh, you know, somebody comes along and they're like, we're going to do this thing where, like, you're online and you get to be, like, a college student in sort of a Harry Potter thing, but we're not going to call it Harry Potter, but it's, like, you know, Harry Potter college student. And, and you, like, can leave your Twitch game that you're playing, like, a maniac eight hours a day, which is what I did when I was totally on crack over that. And, and you're going to come over and join our little happy game, right? So... How are they going to do that? <laughs> you know? How are you going to convince the Adidas users to come over to the Nike club? Um, I don't know. You know, Wizards of the Coast is owned by Hasbro. Hasbro is 
not just a corporation. It's one of the biggest corporations in the world. And so you can't really blame a corporation for wanting to make money off its product. That's, that's kind of their job, right? What right. you can blame them for is being so bad at it. Right? That's what you can blame them for, is that their, their complete gormlessness of, of, of inability to understand how to make uh, the product that people actually want, you know, and that's, that's where they just keep failing. Um, well, and, and, and they're ta tapping into our fads, right? D and D as a lifestyle um, brand is a is going to be great as long as D and D keeps being a fad, but that's not going to be for very long. You know, sooner or later, the 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 people that think D and D is cool because D and D is cool are going to stop playing. Are you going to stop buying these things because suddenly D and D won't be cool anymore? Well, that's the thing is, it's like a brand of that. You have a brand name for this thing. And the brand name, they trot the brand name out with an RPG every however many years. You know, you had original Dungeons Dragons, then you came out with the advanced Dungeons and Dragons. Um, then you waited a while and you got, you know, another edition, 2E or whatever. Each edition would come out and it was like, it's, it's the new and expanded and better and improved. And part of the whole thing is that they wanted to make it more turnkey. Turnkey is the key word there. Is, uh, they wanted to make it easier for the users to use it. And so what they would do is they would clamp down on 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 uh, the rules, you know, and, and they weren't really even Gary Gygax. If you listen to Gary Gygax talk before Advanced Dungeons and Dragons, like he writes these beautiful editorials about, you know, the, the, the role playing game is just being like, like you have this thing and it's like a toolkit and we're going to sell you this toolkit and you're going to make your own game. You can buy stuff. We'll make stuff for you. Um, you know, once again, if I can dig out my wherever I, I hurled that that uh, basic set too. But, you know, at the, I, I bet you millions of gamers are still alive who, who played in this dungeon. It's an Opus dungeon in the back of this little book. But it was the first thing I ever ran, and I got a total, I got a TPK on the party. This I was like DMing my first time, and I TPKed the party up here. Um, and so I think that that's, I mean, this coming back around, they want to have a turnkey thing that, that locks you in, but then they get a big company. You don't want gamers running your company. Gamers are idiots when it comes to running a business for the most part. Um, if you talk to anybody that's been involved with it, I mean, even look at TSR, it was run by gamers and it just took a nosedive because they didn't know how to run a business properly. But um, at the same time... That was, 19, that was the 70s, though. Yeah, like uh, they now, won the lottery. You know, like the lottery. At least one of the gamers even by accident, would have some business savvy or... I'm well, the person they should have kept there. there was McGarry, and they pissed him off, and he left in 76, but he was actually the guy that had a uh, economics degree and was mm -hmm. telling Gary the things that he should be doing with his business, and Gary was like, I don't need to listen to you. So he decided to put the Blooms, who and the Blooms just looked at all this money coming in. There's like a, an article from a... I forgot, I put it in the movie. It's from a a business magazine and somewhere around 1979 there was a big article about D&D &D because it was like making millions back then millions of dollars was like a billion dollars today and uh you know they were asking and and I think it was that article where they asked Bloom like you know well how long do you think this can go on and Bloom was like oh it's going to go on forever <laughs> and the thing about any of these things is that they are trends and and this is like a beanie baby it's going to go on for a year a year and a half two years and then your Beanie Babies aren't going to be worth snot. And then maybe in 20 years, people will be like, ooh, be Beanie Babies, and everybody will be collecting them again. And two years later, they won't be worth snot. And uh, d d is the exact same thing. And so you have these executives that are, uh, they haven't really looked at the history of how the game operates or how games like this operate. And they don't really understand that the, the, what they're selling is, is not a product. They are selling a product that creates an experience. And so, like, you know, like you were saying, the lifestyle venture, you know, like wearing your D&D, &D, your ampersand sneakers is not exactly the same feeling as playing a game of D&D &D and suddenly your party comes through the door and you've, like, run into a minor demon and you've got to figure out. I mean, you know, the, the crap has hit the fan and, and it's awesome, you know. Um, and so, I mean, I, I and that's why I kind of, like, started with that one thing, but it's like, you look at the history of role-playing games, like here's an advanced Dungeons and Dragons second edition Greyhawk Adventures book, okay? 
um, there isn't enough city of Greyhawk. There isn't enough in here to run the whole thing. But the nature of the game then was that they would teach people to use the game. This is your tool set. This is how you use your tool set um, in order to do this. And 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 it's very common for the referee to expand the, tool, the what's there. And the players will interject things that will change what's there or might have ideas that, like I'm always stealing ideas from the players and adding them into my world. And you see this over and over and, you know, it's not like D&D is the only thing. I mean, we got, well, what's this? Oh, I got another, you know, here's Forgotten Realms. I got boxes of this crap. People send it to me like, oh, you want something for your collection? Because you're like a historian. And, um, um, and so we have this hobby that is based really, I mean, oh, yeah, here's Spelljammer, you know, got one of those. But you go through all this crap and, and uh, it's not crap. People put a lot of energy. Here's a city system for Forgotten Realms too. Um, it is not crap. It's stuff that put people put a lot of energy into creating, and the people that put their energy into creating them were gamers above all things. And maybe the CEO wasn't a gamer, but he probably had or she. Um, there was a Lorraine Williams back in the day. Um, somebody at their elbow who was a gamer, and they'd be like, "Okay, this is what the numbers are. This is what the company's doing. What do you think? You know." We're doing some, some, you know, we're trying to figure out what we need to do to keep, keep sales up. And the one thing they did, and that's why I'm, I brought up the whole issue of like, what are the modules like that, that uh, Wizards of the Coast was creating for 5e? Because I got boxes of stuff like this. I'll just keep pulling it out. And all of it is interesting and people bought it, you know, and the other, oh, here's Hello World. Interesting one. Um, that was a great book. Yeah, you got a copy? You want a copy? That one. Here's the world of Greyhawk. Um, uh, this is is this is the early is this the early one I think maybe, um, and it's cool because like this is what we thought our fighters looked like back in the day. They kind of looked like a historical medieval knight, not like some puffy guy on steroids, um, with like weird armor that didn't really fit into. Here's some more Dragonlance, you know. Um, anyway. Um, so that's kind of the other thing I wanted to bring up when I came on the show to talk about this and interject into the discussion was just like, you know, we got this big company. I We all can agree that a big company has to make a lot of money, but they're not really making good gamer decisions that are important to gamers so that they can make money. They're not creating value for gamers so that they can bring in the money. Um, and so... Um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, what do you guys think of what I'm talking about here? I'm blabbing a lot. I'm wondering if I'm just off in outer space. We're going to give some time for, for people in the chat if they want to comment on this subject or if they have questions. Yeah, actually, uh, but, I wrote down uh, one question, Pundit. Uh, Jager asked uh, quite a bit a while ago. I was just looking for Griff to take a breath. <laughs> when doing secret I just want to look at games. I got this box of games here. When doing Secrets of Blackmore on Twitter, you said that the Greyhawk crew or crowd gave you the cold shoulder for cold shoulder for interviews. Any ideas why? Yeah, why do Greyhawk? Oh, well, <laughs> what's that? You hear the question? I, I heard the question. I just thought a, a pundit was interjecting something. Oh, we, I was Chris saying, and I were just I mean, talking about this the other night. We were talking about. Talking I'll get you're garbled. I will get back to the question, but it was funny because Chris and I had this big, you know, Chris is a businessman and uh, like we're kind of a tag team. Like I'm I'm a little bit more creative, but I, I do a lot of marketing. Chris does a lot of, he's creative about certain things too. He interjects things into the products, but he's the businessman. And, um, and so we were talking about like, yeah, back in the day, you know, there were these things. And even if you weren't the DM, you would buy this book. And so that's kind of one of the interesting things that they talked about, which maybe we go into after I answer the question, is the whole idea of it seems like they're sort of shaming their players by saying, like, only the DMs are only 20% of the people are DMs, and only the DMs are buying their books. And I'm here to tell you that it's because they make crappy books, because everybody wanted this book back in the day. You saw it in the shop and you had to have it. And and if you look at the con I bet the I can't see the comments, but I bet everybody's like, Oh yeah, Grimtooth's traps. That was that was the stuff, you know, of many stuffs by different companies, and it was a must-have. But um, as far as going back to the question, um, the 
everybody was really nervous because I was doing uh, a show. I was interested in Dave Arneson, and part of why I was interested in Dave Arneson was because nobody really knew a lot about Dave Arneson, and he had gotten really smeared by um, by TSR, basically. You know, I mean, here's this guy. He helps invent Dungeons and Dragons. In my, I think that he invented Dungeons and Dragons. Gary edited it and contributed to it. They did it together, but if you didn't have Dave Arneson there, it never would have happened. And uh, so after a few years, there's a little falling out because there's like millions of dollars on the table, figuratively speaking. And that kind of stuff happens when there's a lot of money involved. And they got rid of Dave. And then they started to like to smear him in in, in uh, editorials in the Dragon magazine. And uh, and of course, he sued them. And, and the thing that people forget is that Dave Arneson... Uh, in order to go to trial, he approached uh, Gail Gaylord. He said, you know, Gail was his typist. When he was quoted as saying, I never typed a word of Dungeons and Dragons, that was Dave being really, like, sort of sardonic, you know. Um, he had a typist, and Gail had typed it all, and she made carbon copies of everything that she typed, and so she gave him those carbon copies. He had duplicates of everything he had worked on with Gary. And he brought that to trial, and he said, this is... You know, we did this together. You got this new game called Advanced Dungeons and Dragons, but it's just advanced. But there's a Dungeons and Dragons there, and this is Dungeons and Dragons, and it's it's very clear that these two are based, and I've seen on each other, and I've seen big binders that were presented to the judge where they took like every monster that was in OD and D and every monster in the monster manual, and they would just Xerox them together, and they'd say number appearing, nor name number appearing, armor class hit dice and they would go through and show like gee this this game that's you know the more basic one all of these properties are carrying over to the advanced one and they're adding other things in but they're using this in their recipe so dave arneson sued them and uh they decided to settle out of court <laughs> usually you settle out of car court when it's very clear that they're going to rip your head off and 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 stuff it down your neck <laughs> in, in court and so I showed up wanting to do this uh, documentary about this guy that nobody knows about named Dave Arneson. And they had been filled up with all this crap about Gary Gygax is a genius. And, um, um, and people didn't like me, <laughs> you know? And it's funny because everybody thinks that I hate Gary Gygax, but actually I read a lot of Gary Gygax quotes and I love like what Gary Gygax says about the interview. Um, so yeah, I mean that's the that's the main part of it is just these people, they were afraid. Of, I mean that was the sort of when you're a, a, a documentary filmmaker, you're looking for something interesting. When you poke the, when you show up and 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 people react really harshly to you, you know that you've touched a, a soft spot, right? And so the minute that started, it was like, ooh, I think we got a good movie here. <laughs> we're gonna find out some weird stuff that people don't know about right and uh, and we did we found out stuff you know i mean there are other histories out there with all that stuff but they're not going to be uh read as closely as a movie a two-hour movie will be watched and um so yeah i mean that's i mean that's it in a nutshell they think that they thought i was the enemy i was gonna like um basically tell them that the emperor has no clothes and that's what i did but i also said that dave arneson didn't do it that you know the the, the idea of invention People want to believe that there's a superhero genius that invents everything. But when you look at Dungeons and Dragons, you realize that, well, first off, they took this thing from this guy Totten, and he was taking stuff from people earlier. And then and then Wesley did these things, and then he created this other thing, and Dwayne Jenkins did this thing, you know. So you uh, it there is an accrual of ideation, ideas that contribute toward making any invention. I mean, if you I don't know, you write some phenomenal new program. It's like, well, somebody had to invent the computer before you could even write the program on it. So yet you're a, you yes, you are a genius, but you're not the everything genius, you know. Um and so uh I'm kind of going in circles, but I hope that answers the question. Because I, I don't want to get does. back yep. to this Watsy stuff. We've got to get into the section for shilling product, Job, because it's uh getting close to Avengers bedtime. So. Uh -huh. Does he always leave at the same time? Do you work at yeah. like three in the morning or something? Mm. What's that? Do you work His at like three in the morning or something? Or? No, no. 
Okay. Um, you work in a porn store. I look like I should, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. I know you. Part Oops, time, I revealed I might part time uh, you know, porn store, like, owner, operator. Part time, yeah. role player, uh, RPG designer, you know. Right. Um, you take what you can get in life. Uh, no, I... I just, I just budget in time for like a little bit of family face to face of some kind, either, either like my wife and kids will like watch a little something, uh, before right. bed, um, or, uh, or if it's just me and, and the wife and we'll watch like a TV show or, you right. know, part of a movie or whatever. So I got a dumb uh, idea. No, so yeah, I'm not like in bed and I'm like trying to sneak like in next to her, uh, like right. the Megadeth that song, and I'll wake up. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Joe, can you get us to the, to the pro? You gotta do the pitches too? on the product. Apparently, Job is muted uh, or something. Oh, sorry, I was muted. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah uh, I got your thing up. You never Under gave me your shield, so you got Sword and Caravan and Social Encounters up there. Okay. So, uh, Loser! Sword and Caravan, Medieval Adventures on the Silk Road. It's been doing incredibly well, and uh, the first source book has been out for a while now, Social Encounters on the Silk Road, which is not really just for Sword and Caravan. You can use it for any OSR product. It's a, it's a complete set of mechanics for... for uh, an old school style of how to manage a variety of different types of complex social interactions like uh, haggling, intimidation, debates, presenting yourself before a ruler, uh, court cases, all kinds of interesting stuff, making use of the reaction rule rules from, from uh, the D&D that we all know. Um, both of them have been our, our best sellers. Um, soon there'll be some more products coming out by Mad Scribe for for Sword and Caravan, but probably before that, pretty soon we're going to have the Gonzo Companion, which is going to be from Spectre Press, which is going to have a whole bunch of stuff for your weird fantasy and Gonzo gaming. Uh, it's just going to be a collection of all sorts of different interesting things that you can add to a to any OSR campaign to weird it up. Uh, so uh, be sure to keep your eyes open for that too. And uh, I guess that's it for me for the moment. Check out all my products, my RPG Punnett Presents series and uh, Lion and Dragon, of course. Uh, and uh, yeah, it, any of anything I've made is better than what you can get from Wizards. <laughs> so, but that shouldn't be a surprise to any of our audience. Go ahead, Joe. All right. Um, what's going on? Uh, I'm organizing a game jam. For Chult and Alpha Blue and pretty much anything uh, Cortell is publishing related in the IP of that nature. So it's like a six week open game license for Chult and, and whatever else you want to create in that universe or using those mechanics, uh, the vibe, whatever. Um, and yeah, make something and, uh, and upload it and uh, for free or monetize it for profit, whatever. Uh, details on my blog. Uh, so yeah, they got the game jam. I'm like this close to uh, getting the final PDF for Encounter Critical Three. So I'm like, I might have the final version tomorrow night, as soon as tomorrow night. Um, Maybe a day or two longer, depending if there's like another revision or not revision, but you go back and like there's two or three little tiny things that didn't get fixed that you want to fix. And so sometimes it takes 24 hours. Um, and then after that, I don't know how long drive through RPG needs to vet it, because as you know, I am a dangerous, dangerous game designer. And if people don't keep an eye, on what I write and a lid on the kind of influence I can have over the human mind, terrible things might happen, uh, which is why it might take them possibly up to a week to look everything over um, 
again because they already did it once uh, and then let me know that uh, it's got the A-OK -okay, or maybe I have to go back and change something else. I doubt that because they, you know, they vetted it once. They told me what they wanted to change. Wasn't much, uh, but a couple of little things. So I said, okay, how about this? And I think we're A-OK, -okay, but uh, you never quite know. So fingers crossed. I mean, tentacles crossed. It's uh, it's out and available for release on Drive Through RPG by Christmas. Okay. Next up, Joe. I'm just gonna keep showing my book. All right. Yeah. Um, everybody, uh, if you want to get us thing Christmas this year. Uh, and click a like on the video. A like on the video would be a great Christmas. And for God's sake, review just one of our products. Just like write a one sentence fucking review. If there's like a rating system, I mean, come on, go the highest. Help a brother I out. Review something. Fucking review something, okay? I just Over had review. someone do a really good video review of social encounters, for example. Well, it's a lot like when I went on YouTube and you did a review of our book. It's like, wow, right. you know, Pundit did a review. You did a, I did the same thing when when Venture did a review of our book. I was like, wow, you know, somebody's paying attention and doing a review. It's anyway, important, sorry, interrupt right? Me. It is important. Yeah, it's important. Well, yeah, I mean, that's kind of something I've been I've been slogging a lot is the idea of grassroots support for gamers. If you have a company you like that's that's a tiny company that's doing something, you know, post a picture of their game or or say like this is really you should try this it's awesome you know this is right. where you get it put the link that, people you know. that post pictures and stuff like that on social media god love you you're doing the lord's work keep it up um but that doesn't mean that people that don't do that can't find it within themselves to write a review every once in a while there's lots of review sites the products have a review thingy right there you can just quickly rate or review it like in a very short amount of time. So yeah, please do. Please I mean, review that was, stuff. That was the thing we said with our with our movie. You know, I had somebody tell me like, oh man, when your movie comes out, you're gonna be a millionaire. And I was like, you don't know what an independent film is like, you know, people watch your movie and then they forget about it. And it's like, yeah, with all this stuff, it's like if you see the movie, if you if you have any of these games, the, the biggest thing you can do is you can tell a friend about it, you know, especially if it's somebody far away that you don't get to game with directly. You're just like, hey, I found this cool thing. I read this cool game, you know. I mean, there are games that I read 20 years ago and they were so good that I, I would gladly reread the book today just to read the rule book because it was so good. Um, and so, I mean, I won't pitch them now because they're not even in print anymore, but um, yeah. Uh, um, but yeah. Right. Anyway, so uh, if, so the the book of Antithesis is still for sale at the and Bloody Hammer Games. Part for the head and hand riff. Okay. Well, I did my little. While you guys were talking, I demoed the book. I showed a lot of the book on my screen. Um, we decided to keep our Kickstarter backer kit store open. So the Kickstarter is done, but you can go to the Kickstarter for this book and just Kickstarter and then look for Lost Dungeons of Thomas Gore. And um, it'll there's a button there. It'll take you to the backer kit store and you can purchase a book if you're interested. Um, this is, I mean, this is kind of the essence of, of that. This was why I wanted to come and talk too, is that when we wrote this book, you know, there are a million copies of, of uh, like original D and D. There are a bunch of copies of advanced D and D. People have been rewriting all these old rules, and what what seemed to be missing was that there wasn't a lot of literature on how to be a dungeon master, and uh, um, and that's kind of my focus. Like my next book, I'm doing a uh, I'm working on a book called the uh, the Essential Blackmore, which will be in this format, and basically it'll be a little bit about the lore and and background of Blackmore. But more than anything, 
it'll be a book about how to do um, how to run a world setting so that it feels like a living world. It'll be based on a lot of Arneson's writings um, and, and sort of upgraded with my own ideas because the, I mean, that's the thing we were, I don't know if I was talking to you pundit, but like the idea of, of calling it, we call it traditional role playing. People call it the OSR. I don't like that term. I call it traditional role playing, but that's kind of, it seems really stayed and, and, like it's cemented, right? And so that you have to do the thing the right way. And that isn't, that's again, you know, that's not what these games are about. These games are about creating potential and possibility. And then you get into these situations that are just full of possibility and it's up to the referee and the players to figure out what's going on to resolve the situation, however, and then you move on to the next thing. And so really the, the RPG concept is probably like, the, it is a, it is a self refreshing sort of game when you play the game. Every I, every I time you play it. About that specific topic, but uh, before that, um, since we're talking about Tonisborg here, uh, there's a question from the chat. And you know, the S Knight asks, uh, it, "Will there be a print on demand version of Tonisborg?" You know, I'm really against it. I, part of it is that I think that tabletop games should stay face-to-face, -face, whether you're in the same, I mean, you know, these days you could be face-to-face -face on a computer. But um, I think that when you start working on, on digital formats, you change the experience. Um, and and uh, I think I think it's important to, to stay with the more, like, like, like books are going away. They don't even know how to make good books. Um, speaking of, you know, if we want to talk about 5e, I've heard that a lot of the editions are exploding books so you pay fifty dollars for a book and you get it and two months later the cover explodes off your book i know that uh somebody that's fairly famous did a kickstarter for a book and a friend of mine bought it he said it lasted about two weeks before it exploded you know and there was another fifty dollar book um and so we're doing like this is a really fine i mean this is probably the nicest rpg book you can find on the market right now i don't know maybe somebody has one that's comparable you can't really go any higher grade than a handmade book, except for I'd like to get some hand sewn ones instead of instead of perfect bunding. Um, and so I might I might get some hand sewn ones done, even if it's just for myself for my own collection. And then we're also doing this is the uh, this is the mass market. I think it's called mass market. It's just a really cheap, crappy version, but it's still it's not going to fall apart like one of these crappy books that you get from certain other companies. Um, like I had some Paizo books that I, people loan me and they were like right on there, you know, expanding and ready to explode. And I was like, God, you paid 50 bucks for that. And then we have another version that's basically everything that's in this book, only with a card cover. So this would be, um, I think this is an 80 pound version because we couldn't source 70 pound during COVID, but it'll be 70 pound paper. Whereas this is like 50 pound. It's almost like newsprint, getting close to newsprint. Um, but the, the soft cover will be a card cover. It'll look sort of like this, but it'll also um, have 70, 70 pound paper in it. So it'll be a really solid piece. The only difference is it won't have the little, the little, uh, I don't know what you call that, the ribbon and uh, the hardcover. Um, is that what you, what do you wanted me to talk about? Just the product there? That was a question from the chat. So, yeah, there's a oh, yeah, what was question from again? earlier too, uh, Griff, is uh, Charlotte Williams wanted to know if you're going to re release it anything? We are, um, we have it on the backer kit right now. Um, we're not doing the original version was a double DVD and it had like a, it was like two hours and 14 minutes of movie. And then you'd get a DVD that was over two hours of just random interview segments that didn't make it into the movie that were pieces that were being saved for the follow up movie that we can really afford to do. Um, and, um, but back to the, the person wanted to know, I guess, about uh, PDF. I don't really like PDFs and a lot of people scream at me when I'm a bad person. It's like, I'm sorry, I wrote this book. It took me two and a half years. Um, there isn't a huge market for these. Um, we sell them pretty cheap considering how much they cost to make. And uh, um, I don't know. I mean, maybe we'll do a PDF down the road. I'm sort of against it, but I don't run the company. You know, like if Chris says we need to do PDFs, I'll be like, okay, we'll do a PDF. I'll never write a book again, but we'll do a PDF of this book. How about that? You know, um, I just think that hardcovers, people need to experience real books. And then, and then the other thing is, it's just like, you know, the people that want PDFs are the people that collect PDFs. 
massive quantities of PDFs, and they're probably not even reading them or playing them. So, you know, like if you, if you I mean, this version here is going to be thirty dollars. You know, can you afford a thirty dollar paperback, a cheap paperback? Um, I don't know. I mean, is it a cost issue or just the PDF issue? I don't know. But I've, I've, that's kind of part of my thing with, with D and D is that it's like it's a social game. You play it at a table with friends. You use real books. I mean, everybody that's a gamer that started as a kid, you know, had a backpack full of books like this, or books like, like this, you know, and and your dice and stuff, and you show up, and everybody have their backpack of stuff, and uh, like this. Ooh, that's nice. Yes. I like the green. Uh, I yes, want one of those. The chartreuse, one might say. Um, ah, it's the chartreuse. Before I go, I, I did neglect to mention um, that the the Chults through the holidays, uh, Christmas special discounts are still going on. You can also find those on Avengers Old School Gaming Blog. Um, so yeah, buy some books and um, keep it going. All right, I want to get one Good of those. Show, everybody. Good to see you, Griffith. Yeah, good to Adios. see you too. All right, ciao, man. We will see you um, later. Anyway, yeah, I don't know. I mean, the, the PDF thing was something that came up. I went on some forums and people brought it up, and I was like, "Aren't you just glad that you can get the book?" And they were just enraged at me because they couldn't get a PDF. And I was like, "I don't use PDFs." <laughs> well, people find it useful, I guess. Um, yeah. One of the people in the chat. Sorry, What's one that? of the people in the chat, Danny and Jager has uh suggested Yager, that yeah. you could do a digital version of just the maps from the book because those are handy for printing out that way for table right. reference right i don't but know we're talking we're talking about it you know it's not like i'm totally against it i i just like you know i like beautiful books i i was digging through these stacks of games and i found an old history book on the on the narrow gauge railroads in colorado and it was like I went into a bookstore and I found this used book that was like 50 or, you know, it was written in the like 40s, I think, you know. So I had this like, wow, this book's like 80 years old. This is so cool, you know. And um, um, yeah, so I don't know. I mean, I understand. We're talk we're debating maybe doing the maps as a uh, PDF without any markings on them so that they wouldn't be like a full map like you have in the book um, or something like that. I mean... I don't know. The other thing is also the whole piracy issue. You know, I, I people tell me like, we'll just do the PDFs because they're going to pirate your book anyway. If you don't do the PDF, somebody's going to get one of these soft cover versions and just cut it apart and feed it through a scanner, right? And um, maybe, um, yeah. I don't know. I mean, you can do that, I, mean, I guess, if you want to be a jerk. You know? I've got a lengthy experience as a as a game designer and uh, a lot of my books have ended up being pirated of course right um, and you hunt them like mom, dogs right well no my my experience of it is um i don't think that it has it has a net it, it basically has a net zero effect on sales because anyone who downloads from a file sharing network one of my the PDF of one of my books is either someone who will end up buying the book or who never would have bought the book so it it doesn't matter one way or the other you know and and so in, in and and in fact when i know that some book of mine is on is, is being pirated that means that there's demand for it right <laughs> there are people interested in finding out what's in it you know so yeah, uh, yeah. I, I personally and now some of my publishers might disagree because remember i'm not a publisher i'm just a writer but uh from my own perspective i never sweat it when there's you know people pirating books because um i'm certainly making a ton of money anyway so i i'm, I'm you know it's and, right, and i think right. my, i sincerely believe that it's um it's definitely uh something that that doesn't have a net effect on your on your actual sales you know especially when you've made a book that looks so impressive as the Tonis board book does, because there are people who are going to buy it purely based on the quality of the book, right? And for, right. for anyone in the chat who hasn't, any of our viewers who hasn't um, heard about what's in the book, I can, you know, you should check out my my review of it on my channel. But I can tell you that it's 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 got a dungeon that predates the first edition of D and D, one of the formative dungeons of of the Dungeons and Dragons experience. 
um, which is a, a really, you know, it's a 10 level dungeon. It's very detailed. You can run a whole campaign in it. But besides that, it's got a bunch of history notes. It's got a bunch of details about how the game was played at the time. And then in the back, it basically has an entire version of the kind of proto D and D system. You know, uh, that it's it's a very complete book. You know, monsters, treasure, spells, classes, everything. Right. Um, and the quality of the book is really spectacular. Unfortunately, my so life's too bright. You're definitely getting your money's worth from it. Oh, yeah. I if I can put the uh, the table of contents. Yeah. I mean, I really, you know, this whole thing about, uh, yeah, the PDF thing. I know I sound like a jerk when I talk about the PDFs. It's just, I like books, and I want people to like books. What's that? You just sound like a boomer, that's all. <laughs> I am old. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I get it, right? because, because, you know, also, like, we've had this... But you're a historian. Do you want to look at it like a, you've got a collection of books if you're a historian? I know you do. Because you of can't course, get got, a lot of the I'm stuff in it. Your way. Moments, so that's the thing, uh, you know, I, I've got a three bedroom house, and, you know, one of those rooms is completely occupied with books, you know? Right, right. Because you can't get it any other way. Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't know. Maybe, you know, it'll be up. I'll let Chris decide. He'll, if he says, Griff, we need to make a PDF, I'll be like, okay. But I'm never going to write another book again. <laughs> no, really. But, you know, it doesn't actually hurt. And, and you know, it hurts that's my soul. Well. It hurts my because soul. There people, you know, there, there's there's a lot of people that, that do make active use of digital products because they're easier to take around, you know. And especially when, when we're talking about OSR gaming, a lot of people who are into the OSR, um, they're not they're not running one book with one system. Right, they're running right. whatever the main system is that they're using, whether it's you know uh, old school essentials or Labyrinth Lord or Lion and Dragon or Lamentations mm -hmm. of the Flame Princess. But then they're also making reference of tons of other books because the great feature of the OSR is that everything's compatible with everything else. Right, everything is so, up for grabs. Yeah, yeah. So when you're going to run a game, you 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 either have to have a pile of books that you carry around with you, or you're going to have the core books that you need the most, but then you're also going to have, and I mean, I have this right next to where I DM a tablet that's got a bunch of PDFs on it for quick reference when I think, oh yeah, I can use this right now in this moment in the game, right? And, and right. that way I can- Well, I mean, there's a whole section in our book where we, like we talk about, um, I mean, I wrote it, I should know what it is, but um, like I should know it verbatim, right? Because I wrote it. Um, I just I, I felt like it was important to address the fact that if you buy this book, you're going to know all the secrets of the dungeon master, right? And so, like, if you're a player, you don't really want to know the kind of psych job that your dungeon master plays on you when you're playing a game, and um, and and so there's sort of this this uh, like I'm beseeching the people who purchase the book that now that you know you've gotten to this far, and if you go any further, you're going to ruin what the experience of role-playing games is like for you if you learn the secrets of the dungeon master and so you need to consider that maybe in your group you're going to become the tonic sport referee and that whenever you know like we're going to run tonic sport this weekend and i'm on the dm you know and so uh and that's kind of like you know i i guess i should be trying to sell this to everybody like everybody should get a copy and read it you know and it's like well you know there's some good secret information and um, that maybe only DMs should know, or that if you're a player, maybe this is the time for you to like, you know, within your group, just get this book and see if you can run this old system and, and run your players through a totally different game experience that is not like anything they've ever played before because you're going to be playing in the classical way. Um, but um, um, let's get back to like just tear, ripping on Mossy a little bit because that was kind of fun. Um, um, were there other questions that people are asking before we go further, actually, Joe? Like that. I haven't seen any others, but maybe Joe has been paying more attention. So, okay. Uh, Neckbeard, do you, do you almost a, a president, like president? I think he meant president. president. Yeah. We, I think he's from another country, so we... He's Scottish, he? so he doesn't speak much English. You know? Oh, yeah. A president. Pre 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 I can't even do a Scottish accent. See, I'm a horrible dungeon master. I can't do voices. 
a precedence for what for what happened to Dave? That it set a precedent for like later, um, a, a later treatments of designers. Content creators are concerned. I think that's what it means. Oh, yeah. I mean, that's the way. Unfortunately, you know, artists and and designers and people like that. Once the people with the money come in, they're like, "I got the thing, and I don't need you anymore because you made the thing for me, and I can duplicate it a thousand, a million times, ten million times." And um, I'm just watching Job have seizures over here, um, and uh, um, and that happens a lot. Just, you know, true. I mean, that was kind of the when I was. Uh, um, interviewing David McGarry the first time we interviewed him he's he studied econ economics and he talked about the big thing as a game designer during what I like to call the golden age of independent game design is that the designer's name was on the cover of the, of the thing and um, and that stayed there and so you think of games like Monopoly like you think that that just came out of a company but it didn't I actually think maybe a woman designed Monopoly I'd have to look up look it up but um, or or uh, risk you know or designed the game that Monopoly was later based on. She was this socialist that wrote a, a game that was right. about me trying to, to pay the rent. And it, okay. was meant okay. to be, it was meant to be a damning- That's what it was, uh, yeah. She wrote the game and then it was based on that other game. On the capitalist system. And then, you know, some other guy looked at that and said, no, hang on, we got to turn this into a game about becoming rich. And then suddenly it became successful. You know? Right, because that's what people want. Um, um, yeah, I mean, yeah. and that's another example of like people's ideas being carried forward and, you know, um, so yeah, I mean, uh, I mean, that's a really long, long spiel, but um, most of the game designers of that era wanted to keep their name on the game. It was like, you know, Griff's, Griff and Dan's book with Greg Svensson. I mean, it's Greg Svensson's dungeon. Griff and Dan did a lot of the writing. It's our book together. Our names are on it. Um, um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, they jettisons, they that's what happens, you know. I mean, Ernestin was kind of, he he really wanted more just to get his royalties from his thing, and that's why he sued them. Was he, it's like, that's fine, you can go do whatever you want with it, but I, you're going to pay me to use the widget that I made. Um, and so that's what a lot of designers need to do, is they need to protect their work by copywriting it, like really copywriting it by sending it to the Library of Congress and getting a copyright, which costs you like 50 bucks, or 60 bucks now, maybe. Um, but, um, I don't know where else to go with that. You know, that's a whole other show in itself right there. Well, um, what, what I wanted to talk to you about was regarding the, the OSR and, um, you know, old school gaming. Um, because, you know, I was just recently, yesterday, I guess, I was fighting on Twitter with with some of the people from, they, they, there, there are two kinds of, I mean, there, there's the OSR, and the main OSR nowadays is a movement that is very much based on open creativity and innovation. But then there are these right, kind of right. retrograde movements that are that that kind of suck off the OSR, uh, you know, th that they that they have this kind of parasitic relationship with it. Um, who are any group is gonna have their Nazis, right? <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, yeah, well, in this case, literally, because uh, you know, I'm talking about in this case the bro OSR. I know where you're going. Just just run by out. Jeff o. Johnson, who who at one point was a guest on this show. That was before he came out talking about Jewish cabals trying to destroy our our society and how how Judaism is fundamentally incompatible at no fundamentally at odds with our with our culture. Right. Um, so, you know, he's never being like, he's never going to be on the show again, but <laughs> um, right, because you don't want real Nazis on the, side, yeah. the feature of his movement is that he claims that he is the, the guy that understands what what true old school gaming is supposed to be, and he defines it that that it should be playing advanced Dungeons and Dragons exactly rules as written using all of the rules and and not engaging in any kind of um, alteration of them. And there have been other variants of the same idea before, right? Like Jay Malzuski was, was a bit of um, that sort of thing as well, where he was, you know, they, they, where they were talking about trying to find the pure uh, kind of Ur OSR. Or, or, I have the answer for you. I have the answer for you. And it has nothing to do with what those guys do. And it has nothing to do with, with I mean, I'll let, all you have to do is look at what game system was Gary Gygax running at conventions 
in the years before he died. And it wasn't Advanced Dungeons and Dragons. He was running his own dungeon using original. He was using, I mean, there are pictures of him and he was using original Dungeons and Dragons. That's what I'm told. You know, yeah. um, he with just kind of returned to it with a lot of modifications. And that, see, that's the thing about the system is that, I mean, when, when, when AD&D came out, there was a lot of money on the table and there was a lot of pressure. And so Gary just assumed the mantle of, you know, he's the persona. He's going to be the, the, the loudspeaker for the company. And so what the company wanted him to say all of a sudden was that you must buy our books. It is the only real RPG. Everything else on the market can, right now is garbage. You can buy the, the Arduin Grimoire or any of these other Yeah, things. Arduin, Arduin. That's garbage. Well, of course, we love Arduin. I love Arduin, actually. Yeah, and everyone um, did. Yeah, everybody, the minute you saw it, you were like, ooh, this is different, right? Um, and so, uh, and and uh, they were trying to sell modules. They were trying to, they were doing the corporate thing like like WotC is doing, you know? And um, the real, I mean, anybody who knows will infer, I guess most people will infer that the true concept, which is here's your toolbox, do what you want with it. And yeah, um, and, uh, this, yeah this so- This is what I'm trying to get to is that, you know, I would define an old school gamer as someone who was playing D&D at the time when first edition or earlier editions before that were the, were the current game of, of D&D, right? So if you, if basically, if you were gaming before 1988, you're an old school gamer. And yeah. um, by that definition, I know that both you and I are old school gamers. And right. As, but we have to modify. Because one of the features of these these reactionary groups is that the people that 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 are kind of their leaders d- weren't actually old school gamers, right? A lot of them had are, are people that, by their own admittance, didn't play D and D until very recently, and so they've created this kind of cargo cult where they mythologize what it was like right. this golden age, and that it's always about like purity tests. But actually, anyone who was there in the old school era knows that we were, you know, people who were playing D&D at the time were constantly modifying rules, constantly borrowing stuff, constantly innovating, and that that's actually the cent- a central quality of old school gaming is that you're always trying to make up new stuff, you know? Like, it's not, it's the opposite of saying, no, this is the law and we shall never breach it, you know? Like, the, and, and so um, one of the, the important things to me about Tonisborg and and the, the kind of the stuff you're doing, the the your your secrets of Blackmore too, is that it shows how in actual old school gaming there was this constant pro- process of reinvention, which is what the mainstream OSR today is all about, right? It's it's about finding interesting new things you can do with the old school format, you know. Yeah, I mean, I just recently found a fanzine, and I was just like, "This is great!" And it was a bunch of OT and D fans. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, just a lot of articles, different articles, different ideas, and I looked through it, and I was like, "These are great ideas." I'm just going to steal them, you know, for my campaign, um, because that's what we do. We lift things, um, and uh, yeah, I mean, it's just like the the, the big thing is, I think that even when D and D as uh, when AD and D came out. The majority of the consumers, because the big company has the money to advertise, the majority of users, consumers, are going to be going for the company that has the, you know, it's the crest yeah, toothpaste exactly. of, of, of the thing. And it's still, it's still that way. The majority of gamers that come into gaming, their first experience is going to be um, D&D 5e, which, I mean, I mean, we're giving WotC a hard time, but I'm kind of like, I want to give them a hard time for not producing good product for their consumers and not giving them proper value. And now they want to convert them to like this other thing. And it's like, but you didn't even do the first thing right. So you want to go over there and do it even worse. That's great. You guys are great. You know, your fan, you know, your consumers are going to love you. They've just spent like, I don't know, $500 on books and you're telling them you don't want to support that anymore. Yay. Um, So they're kind of, I mean, in a sense, once, once he does that, they're going to be part of the OSR and I'll be like, yeah, come on over. We're doing a, we're actually doing a 5e PDF. So you can use Tonus board with 5e for those people who want to play 5e. My suggestion would be to change some of the rules, like get rid of the death saves, um, make sure that you don't use CRs, combat situations. Half the game is that you scout it. Is it deadly? Is it easy? If it's deadly, we run away. 
learn to play yeah. in the old way where you're like sneaking around the dungeon because there's scary stuff down there that wants to eat your face you know and, and i was like um, on fifth edition and i very strongly tried to to convince mike merles that that um he should just get rid of cr and mm -hmm. i was very opposed to the to the death saves and the short rests and all that stuff you know, yeah like the that. short rests get rid of that it's like the only time you rest well, enough to get okay, spells back and is out of the dungeon make What's those that? optional rules in the dmg right like let people have different levels of of um of brutality let's say right so like that that the main one should be a moderate risk of death and then you can have like easy mode and hard mode right but uh he decided that the right different thing. people will want different things like if you told me like you know i'm gonna run 5e and we're gonna have all those like little little uh baby rubber bumpers to make sure that nothing bad happens to you i'm just gonna be like why do we bother doing combat just tell me we killed the monster give us the treasure and we'll go to the next thing right if i want to play you tell me like yeah we're using 5e but we're not going to use this rule and this rule and this rule it's going to be brutal and you got to watch your ass or you're going to be dead like within three rooms into the dungeon and i'll be like okay i like that you know um i mean it's just it, it just goes just pitching it back to you pundit it's just like you know in the original rules you know i won't you know, it says right in the forward you know it's like these rules are guidelines um you know what what else where's a good line you know it's just like yeah the introduction Ugh. anyway there's this yeah as as with any other set of miniatures rules because this is the culture of gaming in in that era when they were playing miniatures board games um they are guidelines to follow in designing your own fantastic medieval campaign they yeah. provide the framework around which you will build a game of simplicity or tremendous complexity i mean it's it's right there in the original in 1974 they said here's the rules read them try them if you don't like something change it you know wizards and daggers Ugh, it's lame gandalf got a sword i got swords for my wizards you know anyway i'm ranting here all right griff we got another like, question uh, from the peanut gallery here uh l says griff and world is upset at the covered from Still unsteady footing from the major. Still unsteady footing from the major change. I, I don't know. I mean, I see. I'm out of the loop. Okay, I'm. I only play O D and D. I played some Pathfinder. I liked. I thought it was elegant. The three E. That the, the D twenty system. I thought was elegant, but they overuse it. You know, there's just everything is a die roll, and when you play with me, you come into the room and I tell you what's in the room, and you know, like. You come into the room and, and there's a big wood table in the middle of the room and there's a treasure chest on the other side of the room and so the players are like okay we're going to go over by the treasure chest and see what's going on in there you know the thief's going to like feel around the edges to see if there's any sort of like trip wire or anything that would seem unnatural for a wood treasure chest and meanwhile the uh wood table turns into a mimic and peels one of the characters skull open and starts to eat his brain as he <laughs> screams and and other devious stuff happens but it's it's all about you know we're in a we're in a we're in a real world we 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 have reasonable expectations of what this world is going to be like and so the dm is creating reasonable results based on these reasonable expectations that we can all agree on we don't need rules for that we're in a storytelling mode a lot of people like to call it the emergent story and it's like no 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 the narrative is not emergent. Once you start playing, you are in a narrative state, and that is the nature of the game. You are in a narrative state, and um, so with every addition, you know, um, my only complaint, like my only complaint with Five E, is that they're they're uh, putting too many safety nets in there. I mean, if you want them, you can have them. If you don't want to have a combat-oriented game, it's up to your dungeon master not to create combat-oriented encounters, and so it's not the rules that are broken it's your dungeon master's creation of adventures that is broken if you don't like what your dungeon master is doing and you can talk to them between sessions and say hey can we have less combat and more standing around and role playing um you know acting like our character play acting like our characters um so i think that the break happens the the real break is just how they try to monetize the game you know they're breaking the game when they try to monetize it too hard 
um, even original D&D, you know, they, they put this out, it was incomplete, so they put out the supplements, which altered certain rules um, and made it kind of complicated for a lot of people because everybody was playing a different campaign because they were using, they were interpreting or using different rules in these books or else they would add the Arduin books or they would add rules that they found by the uh, Judges Guild journal. Um, and, but actually that was the beauty of the game was that it was very much a, I don't know, it's like buying an old beat up car and turning it into a hot rod, you know, like it's a rusty piece of junk, but I'm going to like do stuff to it. And by the time I'm done, it's going to be phenomenal. And there's no other car like my hot rod on the entire planet, you know? And, I, got, um, I got another question for you, Griff. Yeah. I interject here. I don't know if I answered the question though, but. Oh, you, okay. I don't know. I, I don't think know, you know. Is there a point you're trying to get to? No, but I'm, <laughs> I'm not sure if I understood the question. I mean, it was just like, I just, yeah, I just said it's bro. It's been broken. It got broken when they tried to market it too hard. Okay, you know, well, maybe he can, uh, I can. I really want to talk about this Watsy stuff though, but anyway, go on. What else but, is there? Uh, Paul back, back later, but actually. Your... You have to pick one module published adventure or slash public adventure to introduce new players to tabletop. Doesn't have to be D and D. Which one do you go with? Oh, well, that would be hard to choose. Um, you know, the most fun one, I mean, there's a there's a pirate copy of, of uh, the Blue Holmes, the Holmes basic set, the little book I was holding up. There's a pirate copy on the internet right now that's been up there for years. It will never be republished because Holmes owns part of that and Watsi owns part of that. So neither party will agree to publish. Um, it's it's original Dungeons and Dragons in, in a well-presented manner, like, I mean, it's just amazing. You get this book and it has everything you need in it. And it's like maybe 60 pages long. I mean, it's just this, where is it? It's just tiny. Um, Xenopus Dungeon is really fun and it's really simple. I would say that's like the ultimate. There's actually a guy, Xenopus, who does even a 5e conversion of it. Look up Xenopus Dungeon. You'll find him. You can find Dungeon from him for 5e if you want to run it with 5e. Really nice guy. I really support everything he does. Um, um, but you can find, there it is, you can find this online. Um, I mean, it's just, what do we got here? 45 pages and you have, like, this, you know, you buy all these books and and <clears throat> there's this company selling you books. And, and when I got my start set from, from for 5e, the starter set didn't tell me how to do my own thing. And it didn't really tell me how to be a DM or anything. Whereas here's this 45 page booklet that tells you how to run the game. It has all the monsters you need. It has all the character classes up to third level. Um, it has a sample dungeon. It came in a box set with a lot of different options depending on when you got it. But um, <clears throat> I mean, come on, how can you go wrong, right? And then you got this company that's producing all this garbage. They don't even teach you how to be a DM. They don't give you the resources to turn it into a toolbox for yourself because they want to funnel you into this this consumer thing and i'm all for making money but i i think that you get more value like here's the value right this is your value product because you can be everything you will ever need to know about rpgs is in this little tiny book so when we did our book i'm not pitching the book but i'm saying this is the approach it's like i'm gonna do a book and we're gonna teach you how to be a really good dungeon master and give you ideas and you don't have to use all the ideas but and some of the ideas you might think are stupid you know but um but there's no other book like this out there because nobody thought to use that concept. They were just, they just make dungeons or world settings or new rule sets, but they're still, but nobody's putting in the, the, the sort of the glue that holds it together of how are, you know, how does a dungeon master deal with this situation? My player did this, how do I deal with that? And, you know, um, I could go on and on about that. Um, yeah, so maybe that would be the best thing. As far as best, I thought we were going toward best product, and I was like, ooh, I have favorite products, but does that help? I'm looking at you, Job. You're over here for me. Pull-ups here. Okay. No, I mean, that's the thing with the Watsi, when, you know, coming back to the Watsi thing, though, is uh, are they, you know, do, do you need Watsi? And so my whole thing has been like, well, the consumers coming in now aren't aware of what happened before. They don't have access to the products that came before. So, of course, they're going to go toward the most available product. 
there are a million games out there that are not even set in fantasy settings. You, you look at the sci-fi settings, you've got cyberpunk, punk, you've got mutant settings, you've got you know, uh, Marvel superhero type settings, even from back in the 70s. You've got uh, space travel stuff, you know, I mean, whatever. It's like, you've got all these sci-fi yeah, games out there. In the OSR, in fact. <laughs> so What's you that? Can, that? You have all of those genres in the OSR, just alone, yeah. you know? <laughs> got to get rid of that OSR tag. Retro Gamer. I still think Retro Gamer might be a good tag. Okay. Well, I've been doing the games by gamers for gamers. Or G, GX, G, 2G would be the good tag to use because that's really what we want. We want games that are made by gamers for gamers. And and well, that's, that's the problem. I mean, that's what the OSR is all about, right? Like the, the you know, what I say about Wizards of the Coast in, in, in many of my videos is don't give money to, to people who hate you, you know? And, right, and exactly. Between, yeah, the or corporate don't care about you. And the, the woke anti D D people in charge of of Watsi's design company, uh, you know they're they they hate you if you're a regular gamer. You know? so well, you know you should be careful because the Watsi death squads are going to start coming after you. I hear they have like these ninjas or something. That, I, I've got you know, all the dirty people to so say. They, they don't go oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, I, have I hear that. Yeah. <laughs> But yeah, I mean, back to that whole Watsy thing, it's like, no, you know, a, a, a company should make money. That's what companies do. Companies like Watsy have a lot of employees. And so if they're successful, it's good for their employees, right? And if all their employees are like in your city, then your city also benefits from that because your local businesses are making money because they're selling, you know, their mochaccinos or whatever to the employees at the game company. Um, I was talking to some guys recently and their big gripe, and I kind of agreed with it, was like, you know, uh, role-playing was invented in the Midwest. It's a Midwestern thing. So now that it's yeah. over, you know, like the big game is over there, it's like, I don't know, it's not really, you know, it just doesn't have that Midwest sort of like kind of crack open a beer and sit on the porch and oh, yeah, absolutely. look at the fireflies. The when it went from Wisconsin to Seattle, you know, to the, right. to the left coast, you know. Right. And it's a big part of the problem. But I think that, you know, I, I just don't think that this, when it comes to all the stuff that we've been hearing about Watsi, like, like there's these horrible rule books, like my starter set. And I said, if you, if you can't do this right, I'm not going to buy any other books by you because I got all these other games and I got my old rules. And then they kept coming out with modules. The only people making good modules were the fans, and they were doing it on a separate thing, which Watsi couldn't really monetize, I guess. Um, um, so they're wanting to they're wanting to close ranks and pull everything close to their chest, but at the same time, they're trying to get you over here online. Um, but there's like a million, you know, we don't need them anymore. Like even if you play 5e, ultimately 5e at this point is going to be part of the OSR, you know. There's, I mean, you know, where do you decide where the cutoff point is? I think the cutoff point is when the company that makes the game abandons you. That's when you become OSR or kind of in the classical camp. And um, and you can play it in the traditional way with, with those minor things we were discussing about, uh, just making it a little bit more rugged and dangerous. Um, one of the things like, um, I mean, because that's a big worry. It's funny because they inflated the game. They bloated the game. One of the big problems early on was resurrection. And so what they did was they made percentage rolls that you'd get resurrected, but you had to roll based on your constitution to see if you survived the resurrection. Um, I'm kind of partial to letting people keep their character. I just docked them a bunch of experience points. It's like, that's great. You know, you had an eighth level fighter and you were doing really well, but you got down, but they were able to take care of your body out of the dungeon. You've been resurrected. You're a fourth level fighter. You lost half your experience points. And then even like uh, resurrection spells, I've made it in my campaign. You cast a resurrection spell and you're a cleric, you've just lost a level of experience. And so it's a very precious thing. You don't use it all the time. It saves- My, my game just don't have resurrection. <laughs> Lion you just Dragon. don't have it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, okay. I like it. It's fun because if somebody wants to keep playing the persona, right, they can keep playing the persona. But uh, uh, your persona is just like, it's, you know, I don't know. I get the flu and I'm horrible for a week afterwards. Imagine being resurrected. It'd be like a year of being, you know, before you're back to yourself, you, it might be a while, you know. Um, it's been, it's just been pointed out in the chat in response to, to what you're saying that in fact, for some years now, there's already been a, a sub movement 
um, called the O5R, which is basically people who run fifth edition with kind of OSR principles. And right. uh, so now that they're switching from fifth edition to one D&D to there's this what's essentially going to be a new edition, even though it's quite a lot of the rules might sort of be the same, but uh, it's definitely going to change a lot of the style of the game and it's it's going to wokeify it a lot. And so, you know, the, whenever there's yeah, an I mean, edition change, you get people that, that drop off and those people are going to, some of those people are going to end up bolstering the O5R, you know? Yeah. I hate to go into all the political stuff because I my attitude now is I just won't engage with it at all. Um, I'm not interested when I game. Gaming is recreation for me, and it's in a, it's like a great passion of mine. I've been gaming since I was about, well, I don't know. I, I first played D&D on a computer when I was 14 years old. So we got, I got more than 40 years of this, you know, and, it, and it's a great passion. And um, when people interject these real, it's like, we are not, when you're playing in my world in, in an RPG, you are in a pre-enlightenment world, and there are a lot of awful things there. And, and part of the game is that you have to try to navigate the horrible and try to be a good person in a place that is not very good. And so maybe you even learn about the difference between being good and not being good. You know, there's there's a, a fine line in there. Um, <clears throat> um, and I won't go into details about that, but that's part of the gaming experience with me in my, in my house group with my friends. Um, but uh, I was going to go somewhere else with that pundit, but... Um, no, I mean, back to the whole thing, you know, I think that that WotC is going to do whatever they're going to do. I think that because they aren't gamers, these CEOs, and they're coming from these other platforms, they do not understand what what the role playing game is in, at like the essence of the role playing game, which is something that, you know, began in Dave Arneson's basement. And, and so if they don't understand that, they're going to break it by putting it online because you cannot computer generate a a, the experience of a role-playing game you can use these tools you know like but and and you can't own it because i mean we're talking about we could have been playing a game the past hour and it didn't wouldn't have cost us anything we'd just be on zoom playing a game and we'd have our books for whatever game it was so basically they're i mean it's just like they're throwing in the towel to me it seems like they're just i i don't see how they're going to succeed I see gamers everywhere saying, like, I'm going to keep doing it the way I like to do it. You guys can go screw yourselves. I am not here for you to be like a giant mosquito sucking blood out of my neck because I got the books and I can make my own adventures. And, um, um, yeah, I'm, I, you know, I'm going to have, like, buckets of popcorn. I'm just going to sit back and watch this, this debacle happen. I'm going to, I don't know, it's like watching an airliner crashing into the ground in slow motion. It's just like, and the yeah, end well, you know and but well, luckily the only people on the airline are the watsi execs you know yeah and, well um, the current the current president of wizards of the coast is a woman named cynthia williams which is just what you need is another woman named williams in charge of that D &D. right there yeah. is like i know it's like a nail in the coffin you know like, I, I don't think that there's any actual relation to lorraine williams but you never know um but cynthia williams is on record as having not played D, &D right like she she says that when she was a kid, her brother played D&D &D and he wouldn't let her play. And and so she never played. But has she know? played since? I mean, like, you run no. the freaking company. You tell your employees, I need to know what, what, what we, you know, like, I don't know. You, you see that in any kind of business. It's like you're, make furniture, right? The CEO, if you, the successful business is the CEO that goes down and it's like, look, I'm going to go talk to the guy that does the thing you know, and, and we're going to find out like, there was this great thing years ago. It was a hot dog company. It was an art. It was like a radio uh, show. It might've been a, uh, I forgot what it was called, but anyway, the essence of the story was they built a new plant and they thought like, we're upgrading. It's going to be all modern. It's going to be all awesome. So they start making the hot dogs and the hot dogs are the wrong color. And so there was this guy that retired right when they started the new plant. And so they went and talked to him. And I mean, it's a long, long story, but basically the essence of it is that this guy would take the hot, hot dogs when they were cooked and, you know, they were all sealed up in their little things and cooked and he would take them to another room where they would package them. But the, the distance that he traveled in the hallway and the temperature of the hallway 
actually cooled them in a specific manner that gave them the particular color on the outside that they had. And, and so they had to like basically create these special coolers that modeled this guy rolling big carts of hot dogs down the hallway for, you know, I don't know what distance, but a certain amount of time at whatever speed he walked in whatever temperature so that they could make their product look the same as it did before they changed plants. You know, I mean, it's, it's stuff like that. Like if you own a business, you better know what the guy that, I don't know, even the, you better know what the janitor does for all, you know, you know? And so if, if we got a game company and the CEO doesn't even know what the product is, and we're talking about creating value for the customer, there's a big problem here, I think. And, uh, um, and, and I see just impending failure um, and we don't need Watsi anymore. And I've been telling people that all along It's like, don't play, you know, you've got the rule books, just play it the way you want to play it, but get rid of the company. You don't need them. You don't need all their, all their BS. And um, <clears throat> because RPG is, I don't know, it's kind of like, you know, RPG is mine. RPG is yours. Pundit RPG is yours. All the people watching right now. Um, and it, 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 once you touch those rules and read them, they become your rules, the way you interpret the rules, everything you do with them, the way you deliver encounters to your players is going to be different. Like I can't, you know, I can't do a critical role type voice thing for the life of me, but people seem to like to play with me, you know, um, I'm, I'm rambling. Come in here, Pundit, help me. <laughs> no, I just feel like I talk too much. I think you've, you've just about summed up the whole argument there. And, yeah. Uh, unless anyone's got any other questions for for Griffith, uh, uh, yeah. I, it might be a place for us to stop. Yeah. Uh, I, Joe, just, I mean, comments? now that all the 5e players are going to be part of the OSR, all I say is welcome to the dark side. And have fun. <laughs> We're gonna, I mean, it's going to get better now because you're going to be in charge. And that's what it's all about, you know. Yeah. Do we want to cut it off here? Is that what you were leading up to? Well, uh, Job, do you have anything to add? Uh, no. I mean, there was one other question, but I, I, I don't know. Maybe try to make it short, uh, shorter grip. But L asked, Griff, is it time for D and D to be done and make room for other games? No. Um, I mean, I think that the problem is is that people are confounding the play style. And I'm very, like, when I talk about role-playing games, especially when I compare it to newer games or other games, the play, the play style is a very specific play style. Um, and, uh, you know, when people talk about, like, they say, like, well, I want to play a game, and, but I want more role-playing and not as much combat. And it's like, no, no, you don't understand. Everything you do in the game is role-playing. When you, you know, your dungeon master says, you look down, you see stairs leading into the ground. Your dungeon master is well playing by describing this, what's happening around you. You close your eyes, you can see these stairs leading down into the darkness. And then you get to the bottom and you see a door. And then the players, you know, the dungeon master might not be sure that the players know it's their turn to decide what to do. So the dungeon master says, what do you want to do? And so now the players start talking amongst themselves. And this is fun when you're the DM, when you just listen to them plotting, like, I don't know, see, you know, see if you can find anything weird about it, or let's check the walls. Maybe there's a secret door down here or something. Um, all of this stuff, you have a, a real environment that's being created in your head. And like I was saying before, you have reasonable expectations of what this environment is like, because a stone is hard, just like a real stone in this environment. And wood has the properties of wood, just like a real wooden door would have um and so you can agree that these things behave in the same way and so the results of how you interact with this is going to be a reasonable result based on a reasonable expectation um and so everything that you're doing in interacting with this world is role playing and certainly you're going to talk to creatures you run into if you can a lot of creatures will say things like ah and come running at you and try to cut you up then you fight them. If you're fighting them, you are role playing. Everything in the experience is role playing, and everything in it is a narrative condition. Because you, and if you do it in the classical way without miniatures, you are uh, just immersed in this in this experience. Um, so when you say, you know, like, do we get rid of D and D? It's like, no, you don't get rid of D and D. You just get whatever rules you want, and 
you use whatever rules you want to create whatever kind of reality you want. Um, in my own, own world, I combine science fiction and, and weird dimensional planes, and you know, my characters can step into rifts between different planes, and they end up in different places where things are are really different. You know, um, I'm, and I mean different to the point where it's more like an Escher drawing, and maybe like you go into the dungeon, you go out in the hallway, but then you didn't take any turns, and you end up where you started. You know, and it's because the the, the dimensional space is even altered to that extreme. Um, I mean, that's the sort of stuff, you know, like nobody at Watsi would think to do something like that. It takes an idiot gamer like me to think of something like that, and or an idiot gamer like you to think of something like that. So I say, you know, I mean, in my game group, we call it D&D &D night, but we play all kinds of things at D&D &D night. We just use D&D &D as sort of a, a wrapper to say RPG, classical style RPG. Um, or traditional role playing. What's that, Joe? Like Coke. Yeah, Coke or Pepsi or soda or pop, you know. Um, and so, I mean, that's the thing. It's like hammering on, on Watsi tonight. It's just like, you know, you guys are being jerks because you're not providing something of true value to your customers and you're not helping them realize the full the depth and breadth of, of what they can do with your product. And you're not providing them with a toolkit that like an erector set or Legos that lets them do whatever they want when you do provide that you charge them extra you know um and so um yeah you know don't give up on D, &D if it's the sort of setting you want i would say watch a lot of cool movies and read a lot of books and that's i mean that's the other problem is that because they want a hermetically sealed uh they want their product to be hermetically sealed and so they're uh, encapsulating the argument um which you'll that's a good you know uh, Urbanski, when you argue with the woke, that's what they do to you. They encapsulate the argument. Um, just a useful term for you. But, um, um, you know, so they want you in this place where uh, even the lore and everything that happens in the world is based on the art they provide you and, and the maps they provide you and the rules they provide you. Um, and and uh, whereas you can go to the library or you can go online and you can start researching things and you're not going to lift them directly, but you're going to use them as inspiration. Um, so you might read about the Inca or the Maya and you might be like, wow, that's really cool architecture. I'm going to put, you know, my world, they're going to have these like temples that look like pyramids, right? And because I want to re research history and I think that's really cool how they did that. And then you're going to look at something else and you're going to like, yeah, but I like the way the castles are. Or I, I like the architecture by, you know, I don't know, some French architect or something that does crazy stuff, right? Or, or who's the guy that did the stuff uh, like in, in Barcelona, the really famous, is it Gaudi or something like that? You know, really weird, twisty stuff. I'm going to use that in part of my city or in my dungeon. Um, so you have like, you, you have this game that's about creating fantastical experiences so start making fantastical experiences and just use everything at your fingertips that you know any any book any picture anything you find online and and just just go crazy um yeah i don't know i mean that's my big thing with it it's just like it is your thing use it do your thing with it make it special um and i yeah. forgot the question was because i started going off on all this stuff <laughs> i always do that all right, let's just end with that. You know, it's your game. Make it your game. I mean, that was what I said in Thomasburg. I think we talk a lot about making the game your game in Thomasburg. And, and that's that's what it's all about. Yeah. Well, uh, this has been a, a great episode. Thank you very much yeah. for coming back yeah, again. And Were we harsh enough, though? Like, I, I come on this show and I expect to be kind of a jerk. And maybe I wasn't enough of a jerk. I don't know. Well, considering that you didn't want to get into the politics of Wizards of the Coast, that, uh, that's, uh, I think you did a pretty good job. All right. Of, yeah, like, I didn't. I didn't the, because I don't the, care. The, the yeah. Thing. yeah. I just don't think it's worth talking about. It's like, you know, it's like talking about fighting over what toothpaste you use or fighting over what kind of shares you choose to wear. I'm sorry, but it's part of what makes them suck, though, right? Because, because their yeah. ideology demands that every setting has to look the same and every setting has to be uh basically uh seattle in 2022 you know like you can't have 
um, no, it culture. Is, it should be the Midwest in the 1970s. They have, be, they have to be these multicultural societies that have modern day West Coast liberal values. You know, all of them have to be that way because if not, you're committing some kind of a hate crime, you know, by having a, a, a right, right. You know, and orcs can't be evil anymore. You know, like that's 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 all stuff that you know, comes in because of their politics, you know. Yeah. Well, I mean that you know, I mean I could discuss all of that stuff and that would be another show. But if you do all your research on orcs, for one, for starters, they do not have dark skin so they cannot be black people and then <laughs> there are other sources that are from letters that tolkien wrote and you can read them literally and you might think that what he's saying is that he's like literally saying that they're asian people but that's not what he's saying either like well, there was a passage where he talks about he 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 wanted his orcs he wants his readers to feel the same way that somebody who lived in the middle ages might feel about the mongol hordes that are descending on their their nation you've never seen a mongol but you're getting word that there is this like horrific army that's invincible and massive out there and it is going to come and they're going to do bad things to you and and so you know it's it's a literary reference is what he's saying is like you know it's like a monster movie you know the horror movies you don't see the thing until later at first you don't see the thing like if you watch even jaws which uses a, a horror format at first, you never see the shark, and it is absolutely terrifying. When you finally see it, it's just kind of like, you know, and it's not that terrifying, and then they kill it. That's what they do in horror movies. So when Tolkien talks about orcs, he's not really saying, like, they're this or that. He was creating something literary that's supposed to be a monster, like something out of your nightmares. That's what I, my interpretation of all of this. And, um, and on top of that, um, I mean, he calls them orcs, which is the, the word orc it literally means monster. It's an old word for monster. I think it might be from French uh, or derived from French. And um, um, I mean, here you go, pundit. You know, you get people that like to read books and history books and stuff, and they look this shit up and they, they find out yeah, well, what it really is, want, right? If you I mean, want to face real Mongol hordes in your RPG game, pick up Sword and Caravan. <laughs> right. And they will tear you up too, won't they? Just like the real Mongols were totally yeah, badass. Yeah, yeah. Read the chronology section of Sword and Caravan, and you'll see what they did to the Silk Road. <laughs> right. I mean, they just went in and they took over. Yeah. There's no. no there's no derisiveness over, there. It's like these guys are badass. They were the largest cities in the world uh, in a question of you know 18 months. Yeah. They, 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 yeah. they murdered millions of people. You know. History is um, full of stuff like that. You know. Um, so yeah, the whole orc thing. You know, and then on top of it, I believe that orcs were created by the 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 dark elf i mean even dark elf like um when you say dark elf you're not saying that they are dark skinned we're talking about like middle ages europe there are not going to be a lot of dark skinned people up here they're all you know pretty pale up there because it's it's not as sunny as other places and there are reasons for for things like that and so what they're what he's really saying is that they practice the dark arts and so it's sort of a reference to being good or evil you know, and I don't know. I mean, all that stuff, it's just, it gets so tiresome, you know, because I could, I could spew that at somebody that believes all that stuff and they're not going to agree with me. And they're not going to, they're not open to any other interpretation because they, they're, they're absolutists. What's that? Yeah. They're ideologically trapped. Yeah. They, right. If you're an absolutist, you're ideologically trapped. And, and anything that somebody, you know, it's like telling somebody that, uh, you know, dinosaurs exist that wants to deny the existence of dinosaurs because they're not in the Bible or something like that and can't like put those things together. They'll just tell you like Satan went and put bones in the ground. You know? <laughs> like, I mean, okay, you know, like whatever. And I'm not arguing for being a, a, a non-believer either. I'm, I'm just saying, you know, it, there's, there's, you can't argue with somebody that isn't isn't open to discussion you know so yeah i mean we could go down that road pundit but i just don't want to go down it because it's a waste of time i'd rather talk about gaming and and make fun of watsi and how we're watching it do this slow motion hindenburg into the ground and yeah, it seems like you know, every passing week they and you're standing back more what's that irrelevant oh my god the Indian woke community all, you know yeah yeah so um um hopefully people enjoyed listening to this gag while well, this crap but um Maybe we should cut it off now.
yeah, this seems like a good place to stop. So uh, for everybody who's watching, um, our next episode is going to be, I think, on the 15th of January. So save your, your spot on the calendar. And I don't know if we're going to have a guest star or not, but... Uh, I've, I've we're, been we're talking to some people. Maybe. I think I, I, I don't have the dates worked out, but I mean, I th I'll go ahead and say it because I'm pretty sure you guys in the past have said you wanted them on. It's uh, the Red Room. I'm talking to them. Oh, good, I, good. Yeah. Oh, yeah, the Red Room. Yeah, they're fun. So they're great. I don't you know, know everybody hates them. Yet, but hopefully it works out. If then, if not, I'm I'm trying to reach out more to, to people, you know, months in advance to just kind of line up the shows. Because... I like Sylvia and Miguel at the Red Room a lot. And they're a perfect example of, like, these people running around telling you what you should do morally. I don't want to get into the politics, but they make games for adults. And, and they love old 70s pulp movies. And so they make their games are basically based on like really awful pulp movies and they're yeah. having a blast doing it and they're not evil they're just like into weird old horror movies and stuff like yeah. like daughters of darkness and stuff like that and uh i'm probably ruining i should make them just they're evil they're bad don't buy their product because more you what is it the barbara streisand effect the more you try to like mask it <laughs> the more people look at it you know like yeah, they're bad people. Don't buy their product. Don't look at their Anyway, product. I don't know don't if we'll have them on record. next month, but we will this coming year, definitely. Can I ask you guys one thing that I wanted to ask? Is like, uh, can I get invited to a game session? I just want to well, game we don't, with you guys. We don't do game sessions on inappropriate characters. We just chat. <laughs> no, but I mean, you. Ha I know you have to game on Zoom somewhere because you're down in, in Uruguay. How do you game with Joe? You guys got to have some sort of online thing going. Well, I, I have a playtest group for Sword and Caravan that that is that that we run a a long term campaign in. But uh, can I yeah, come be a hamster only, or something? Or, I don't I don't know. Online, everything else I play here in Uruguay because you know Uruguay has a really big gamer community actually. Oh right, oh, okay, okay. Well, never so mind. I, run, I just I, I just played with online. with uh, I just played I'm with uh, running James four Moore. campaigns. One of them is this online campaign of sword and caravan but then the the other the other three are here in uruguay one of which is in english and two of which are in spanish and uh yeah i've, I've never been a big fan of gaming online but i i i i took it up when i was doing i did when i did the play test of invisible college and then later when when i did the play test of sword and caravan so that's okay. uh yeah that's basically the only online gaming I do. The, the The guy that does more online gaming is Venger, I think. He, he, he's yeah. run Charles he quite a few times. He just does Zoom, though, right? I have no idea what he used. Okay. All right. You got to just cut me off or I'll keep talking because I just go, <laughs> you know. I was on a show. I was on for like four hours or something. I mean, we were like, it just went forever. You know, I can just talk. So and that's because that's everything I'm, from today, guys. Uh, and... Uh, We'll uh, we'll see you all later. Thank you so much. Be sure to hit the like button if you haven't already, and if you if you aren't subscribed, to subscribe. And uh, if you want to support us on inappropriate characters, check out our Patreon channel, our Patreon account, or whatever. I don't know. The link should be somewhere in the. Oh yeah, it's right there in the description. And uh, be sure to check out uh, the Lost Dungeons of Tonisborg, as well as uh, me and Venger products and Job's product.